So, again, the theme here is that whenever we have gotten into trying to control or manage experience, we block out the mystery that's here and we cut off from our own uh, deep qualities of compassion, intuition, wisdom. So the inquiry is given that, we start finding that suffering is our flag to take the hands off the controls. That when there's suffering, that's a message to, okay, stop managing, desist from the fight-flight activity, whether it's the churning of the minds, trying to figure things out or blame or judge, or whether it's your activity, an addictive activity to get away from the moment, whatever it is, pause take the hands off the control and come back. And one of the ways that, one of the metaphors that's been helpful to me is to consider the difference between, you know, you're in in very rough waters, the currents are against you, there's all sorts of winds blowing in all different directions, and, you know, you're paddling like crazy and becoming exhausted and angry and, you know, banging the paddle against the boat because the paddle's not doing what it's supposed to do and blaming yourself and blaming the wind, that versus you put aside the oars, you put up the sail of presence and you let the wind, you know, you just do that gentle, appropriate response, you know, kind of with the rudder and let the winds, the universal winds of wisdom and love guide the boat. We can't do it. The ego self cannot do it. We can't liberate ourselves, we can't do anything for others. There's an incredible moment of wisdom when something in you says, I can't do this. That's actually a moment of perceiving that what you are is larger than that I and of course that story of the egoic self can't do it. So there's a shift in identity. When we take our hands off the control, we shift from being the controlling fear-based egoic self to opening to a presence that's vast and has access to universal wisdom. That's the shift. Now the challenge is that in taking off our hands off the controls, we have to encounter the fear and the pain of loss that we've been running from. And sometimes it feels like it's too much. In other words, when things feel really um, horrific and we're getting blown around and we feel very stirred up inside, sometimes we can't immediately just say, okay, I'm not going to control anything, I'm going to open to the winds and be buff- you know, buffeted by the winds. We might wake up in the morning with dread about some upcoming project, or maybe our teen's out late with a car and we're gripped by fear, am I going to get that dreaded phone call, you know? Or maybe somebody's anger has brought up old trauma. That's not a time to say, okay, I'll take my hands off the controls and just feel what's here, because it may feel like too much. So first, in this last part, portion of the talk, which is the kind of how-to portion, I'd like to say there's a step before taking your hands off the controls when you can sense that it just feels like too much to contact what's here and raw. And I call that step resourcing, in some way accessing uh, some resources that we need to help us find a little more balance and stability. And in a way, there's, there's a number of different ways we can direct our attention so as to calm down our nervous system. It actually helps to activate the parasympathetic nervous system and quiet the sympathetic nervous system. So what are those ways? We can direct ourselves to our breathing and just take a few minutes of breathing consciously a little bit longer on the in-breath, slower and longer on the out-breath. It changes around our nervous system just to breathe like that. We can ground ourselves, and that is saying, okay, I'm here, and feel the pressure of sitting on a chair, the feet on the floor, and sense this belonging to the earth. 
when you remember gravity and feel that stability, it actually again soothes the nervous system. We can offer metta, loving kindness, put our hand on our heart, offer some, some well-wishing, or we can reach out to someone else and let contact and a larger belonging help to, again, calm us. So there are ways to calm ourselves down that are intelligent and this resourcing actually is what will allow us to then be stable enough to then say, okay, let go, let go. So that's not cheating. I just want to say that, that this is not one of these radical jump off the cliff things where you have to, you know, just say, okay, it's a good day to die, you know. It's like <laughs> you, you can first do some things to settle down when things are feeling wild and then explore the not doing and the pure being with. So let's, let's talk about how that can happen. I, I was thinking as I was... Um, reflecting on this of one man a few years ago um, from this area who had, when, the, when there was a real, real dive in terms of employment, lost a job he desperately needed, uh, really relied on it. His family, and he was very shaken and his way of trying to control things was obsessive thinking about what was going to go wrong and how he could get a job and, try, you know, he, he just was on, he was just churning on it and also drinking too much and eating too much. So that was, those were his control strategies. And he'd wake up in the middle of the night in a panic. And so for him it was not, okay, let go of the controls. First for him it was teaching him that breathing and then just a few phrases that I found can be very helpful when we are feeling isolated and freaked out, which is, this is suffering. Other people experience it too. This is suffering. Other people experience it too. I'm not alone. And then, may I be kind. If you've read Kristen Neff's book on self-compassion, she has this a little more elaborated as these phrases that can begin to be like an anchor in the middle of really rough weather. So he would, he would do that and um, that helped to soothe him and gradually he was then able to practice rain, which uh, I won't go into right now, but practice a mindful awareness where he just stopped controlling and he just started investigating and being with, <coughs> kindly being with, the um, dread he had about the future. And what happened in that process, he discovered the fear and he also discovered the shame that he had for losing a job, even though people all over were losing jobs, um, discovered that. And in that process of being with, just moment to moment, he could find that in the moment nothing terrible was happening, it was just unpleasant. And in the moment he started feeling more of a kindness towards himself and started finding space started finding space. And, and this um, really opened up over a period of a few months. So then, yes, he did mindful, actively start, continue to search, but it was coming from a very different place, uh, much more balanced, much more equanimous. Three steps there. First, do some self-soothing, what I'm calling resourcing. Okay? Then let go of controls, be with, stay, be with, find that space and then act from presence, not from that egoic, fearful, striving, aggressive, defending place. For most of us, I think we, do, I think we need to do both, both the resourcing and the letting go. Most people I know, there's kind of a back forth. So as you experiment more, you hit that suffering, you say, okay, this is a time I should stop controlling. You might find it's helpful to find ways to calm yourself first. Now, let's look a little more closely at how this happens that we actually take the hands off the controls. Because that can be a very conscious moment of this ego can't handle this the strategy I'm using to try to take care of what's wrong, the fight-flight strategies I'm using aren't working. It's not working, an ego can't do this. There's a moment there of illumination, of realization that's really powerful. 
So I'm going to give you a few different, um, it's kind of the closing here, a few different uh, examples of ways that we can do the surrendering of control that you can just experiment with. And then we'll do a short meditation on this. And one, uh, for me, very powerful story, and as a parent, um, that I think that if, for those that are parents you can really relate to it, was a woman who for a decade, I think it was, was accompanying her daughter as she was struggling with addiction, very, very severe. Um, she, the daughter would um, go in and out of recovery. It was addiction to heroin, but also cocaine. It's just many, many rounds of relapsing. Then her mother would help to save her and take her into the house and give her money and get her into, help her get into another program and the hopes would build and then they'd be devastated when her daughter would call and she had been homeless and drugging again and re- many, many rounds. And inside this woman there was this swing between total rage at her daughter for not cooperating, not getting it together, and then um, this fear that was the most gripping fear she ever knew that her daughter was going to die. Okay, so that was, and, and, that, and that fear and rage was keeping her in this egoic doing, which was being totally enmeshed and codependent and sa- trying to save her when she couldn't save her. It wasn't working. Okay, so this is an example of it wasn't working. It's very clear that her way of trying to cope was not working. So she said it was very distinct, the, um, the time, the round when her hopes had been high, they got plunged again, she got the call, and something in her said, really got it, that it's out of my hands, this is bigger than what this ego can manage. And something in her just said, okay, may this be handed over to the for her it was kind of the Divine Mother, the Mother of the Universe. Let this, this is in the hands of something larger, whatever happens, happens. And in that process, this is letting, taking her hands off the controls, she was, it was she's described it like this bottle that got unplugged and all the grief about loss that she was holding in her whoosh, came out. It was like, as long as she was trying to save her daughter, she wasn't completely plunged into the grief about loss, but she had to face that. And for several months, her process of take the hands off the control was a real honest process of grieving, of just getting it. She may die, she's already lost a lot of life. Really, the, um, that, that knife cutting through the heart, breaking it open in grief, until what she described of staying and staying, fear and grief still there, huge, huge, vast tenderness. And she said, I was finally able to feel this compassion towards my daughter that I hadn't felt when I was busy trying to manage things, and total capacity to set the boundaries, to say no, but to hold for her daughter a mirror of potential, of possibility. She, she sensed possibility, but she was able to say, no, you're not, it's not going to be because I save you. And um, that, in more recent years, contributed to her daughter's recovery, and I can say it's been now a few years, so... Um, but the purpose of me sharing the story is she wouldn't have taken her hands off the control if her wisdom mind hadn't registered, I can't do this. And then there was the courage to be with what she was avoiding. So we're banging up against the wall and, you know, there's different ways we recognize and let go. For another man I worked with, and this, this is another story, I'm beginning to put, share the stories that I included in True Refuge um, because it's coming out so soon. For one man, um, he was struggling with cocaine and with anger issues, and he was in a 12-step group, and he heard, another man shared with him his mantra, which was, not my will, but my heart's willingness, you know, to keep, to keep shifting, not my will, not what I want, I think, you should, they shouldn't, 
but my heart's willingness, just to keep coming to a kind of willing heart. And um, for this man, that shift brought out... He was um, already a leader, even when he was in his fight-flight mode, because he just had a charismatic personality. But he became a true leader. And he became a leader in, his, in the recovery field, you know, just one of those very a tremendous amount of wisdom and heart and in his uh, work environment too. He blossomed. Not my will, but my heart's will. Again, it's the shift in identity from thinking I'm doing, I'm going to protect myself, I'm blaming, I'm blaming myself, I'm blaming you, I'm controlling, to not this ego self, but something larger that we belong to whether we consider it our awakened heart, our Buddha mind, Divine Mother, loving presence, something larger can come through. And then the wind can blow through our sails and, it, and there's not a sense of a self doing it. For me, I often find that just this just when I'm feeling like I'm encountering something in me that won't change and then I realize I can't change this, you know, an ego can't change an ego or something in the world that I just can't handle that's causing pain to me or to another person and I have some idea that I want to make that other person better and some idea that I should be handling it better and I can't. I take the whole thing in two hands the whole experience of this ego trying to do things. And I do this gesture like this, which is a kind of bringing my palms up and offering it into something larger. And I know I'm just, in a way, it's just another symbolic gesture saying, okay, this ego is an idea and a story and there's energy around it and there's belonging to something larger, to consciousness, to love. So I'm handing it over to something larger. In a way, what we're talking about tonight is the whole of the spiritual path. That over and over we re-coagulate into a sense of a doing self that has to fight or flee or prove or defend. It just happens every day over and over again. We keep reinventing ourselves. And really the path is about recognizing that and in that moment of recognition just a kind of a letting go, a relaxing back and just being in the flow, being the awareness. And over and over again, so where there's the more tangled issues, 10,000 times, they say our deliberate practice is 10,000 times of recognizing, sensing the suffering, because we can feel the suffering in it with any identification with a separate self, there's suffering. It might be the overt anguish of something's terribly flawed about me, or it might be a more subtle kind of suffering of just a restlessness, or a sense we're not quite at home yet. But there's some tension that's a reminder to, okay, there's a story of self identified, let go of the controls be with what's right here. And if we do it the 10,000 times, each time there's that shift in identity from that kind of smaller, tight, solid sense of me to this much more amorphous field of presence until that field of tender presence becomes more familiar as the truth of who you are than any story of a beleaguered self, a victimized self, a perpetrator self, a doing self. It becomes, that's, that experience of that field of awakeness and tenderness becomes home. So let's practice a little, just take a, a, f- a few minutes to explore this.
pausing to let your attention go within and scanning your life to sense if there's somewhere that you feel you've been caught in the controlling ego trying to make life different and know the strategies are actually just keeping you stuck might be trying to control others maybe trying to control your own unwanted behaviors trying to protect yourself in some way prove yourself just in a way as if you're putting a frame around a picture just let that be right center of your attention where the controlling is going on you might notice how you're doing it whether there's a lot of blaming a lot of obsession, a lot of fixating whatever your style is of trying to manage just sense your intention to explore taking your hands off the controls and instead touching what's underneath the discomfort, the fear, the hurt the pain of loss and takes, it takes some courage so you might sense your heart's willingness to come home to something larger by simply taking your hands off the controls and explore right now what is asking for attention if you couldn't keep controlling around the situation what is it you might have to just open to embrace, make peace with the fear of loss, the pain of loss breathing with whatever's there right now just touching it some you don't have to you don't have to dive in deeply but just opening some so you're letting go of defenses letting go of obsession and just opening into what's here gradually as you open into what's here you'll find some openness and if you bring kindness right now to what you're experiencing you'll find a a tender openness so you might continue putting your hand on your heart and just offering some kindness to whatever you're discovering whatever's in there letting go of thoughts letting go into what's right here Ajahn Chah says, if you let go a little, you'll find a little peace if you let go a lot, you'll find a lot of peace if you let go absolutely, you'll find absolute peace and tranquility so stopping the war bringing presence to what's inside us and resting in that presence you might sense if you could bring, instead of controlling bring a quality of presence to this situation how you might respond with more balance more equanimity more love to your life
closing poem by Michelle Rivers. When words stop, you can hear the songs of the sea. In silence, lean on each other. We are together in the same boat. Let go of the oars. Trust this hole. The rudder knows answer and questions. Gently let all movements bring you closer to the divine current. Gently let all movements bring you closer to the divine current, the all-embracing sea. Waves break. The oyster melts with love. Look what happens when you let go. Gently let all movements bring you closer to the divine current, the all-embracing sea. Look what happens when you let go. Namaste. Thank you for your attention.